We have many different possible solutions for generating structure from motion uh, uh, data sets, um, tools, outputs. And so this is just the first one, right? So let me just explain. So this is, this is open source, which is great. We love open source stuff. That means we can uh, get in it, we can play with it. If we were so inclined, we could modify it as needed. If we find a problem, we can report that, that problem, et cetera. As opposed to traditional software, which is proprietary and closed, and it's, it's, my, it's my door and you can't get in, right? And so, so um, there's advantages to both. There's advantages to both. And I would say that for you all in your career going forward, it's great to have both of these types of tools. Generally speaking, generally speaking, um, you know, so this is free, basically. Well, we, we, we purchased the installer for, for us, but, but, you know, the software itself is, is free. Um, but that's usually going to mean there's some more, uh, it's not very sexy, or it's a little bit harder to, to use, or, or, or this or that. It doesn't necessarily mean it's less powerful, but the turnkey aspect, where you can just sort of roll on in, it, you know, flip on the switch, and boom, go. Generally speaking, the open source software is a little bit um, harder to do that. And the, and the proprietary solutions, the proprietary tools are going to be much slicker and, and ease, easy to use and, and those kinds of things. Um, the trade-off also is they don't always give you as full control or resolution over, over the, the architecture that you're trying to do. And the clearest example of that is um, DJI and flying and how DJI wants to make sure everybody's safe, which is great. And their lawyers are freaked out they're going to get sued, which is bad. And so those things come together with them. Um, very frequently restricting where we can fly our DG, DGI products, right? Just, just from the basic idea of, of pulling the sticks down and launching up. And so that's, that's an example of one of the downsides of some of the closed um, software systems and stuff. Okay, so you guys get it, so this is it. So I have this home running my Mac, but I believe it's very similar when, if you ran it from your PC, you can run it from Linux, all, all those, I only gave you guys the PC and the, and the um, Mac installer said, nobody said that they were necessarily running Linux. But, um, but the basic idea here is this tool is gonna run in our browser. Okay, so, the, so, so, it's, so there's some background stuff, but the interface, the looking at Jazz, is through our browser, uh, inter, through a browser interface. Um, this is designed to run on our computer, to run our local machine. So if we have a new computer with tons of memory, rock and roll. If we have an old computer, or if we have limited amounts of, of RAM, um, it's gonna either go slow or it's not gonna work at all, right? And so, so this solution that you have in front, or, or that you, if you haven't installed yet, you can install after this. Um, this solution is basically free. So you could be out in the middle of the desert somewhere and run these, run these solutions. As we get to more complex mapping runs, which basically means more pictures, more, 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 more triggers, more snaps, more files, and or less, less visual uniqueness, right? So, so as we get to more beaches, as we get to more water bodies, as we get to more rows of corn, those types of things, that is harder to, to see distinct elements and therefore to map up, uh, to, to, to figure out in, in three-dimensional space where the images are that will need more power. So as we go to more hard to do things in larger sizes, even our fast computers will start to have problems, right? And so through this option, you can also use, there's a cloud sourced thing, a cloud sourced option. So in other words, you, we could use this essentially as a throughput. So we can use this tool to upload our images to that cloud software service and then it will run. It will do all the, the math and all the running of the computer on somebody else's computer, probably Amazon Web Services, which is what almost everybody uses these days. Um, and then and run them and on virtual machines and all this and that, and then give us the answer. So one that allows you to do much more complex mapping outputs, much larger scale mapping outputs, and to do them generally speaking much faster. Essentially what they're doing is this, it's the same exact math that's happening in your computer, but my computer is right here. And my computer has to do step A, and then step B, and then step C, and then step D, right? Which, you know, these things are incredibly fast and amazingly powerful, especially compared to when I was younger, right? 
but it's still just my computer. What those web services do, again, it's the same under, it's the same math, it's the same program, and everything. But what they do is they say, oh, look, at Dr. A has these, um, I don't know, 35 different uh, parts of his project. Rather than try to run all 35 through one individual processor, it carves them up and says, hey, Eddie, you take uh, you know, part one, and Dalton, you take part two, and all the way around, two, 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 two. And then it individually runs those parts, and then it reassembles them. That's why it can go faster, and that's why their machines don't break. So um, make, make sense? So there's a free version of that, or, or when you sign up and, and do it the first time, there's a free version you can get. And how these things work, since many of you have probably not used these before, they, the, the most, there's different models, but the most popular model is credits. So when you first sign up, they give you some free number of credits, right? And that, that would be enough to do for sort of small, moderate, uh, you know, drone mapping of a field kind of thing, small field. That would be enough to do, you know, two or three little example projects. And then you'd run out. And then you, it's like a pay per service. So then you'd, you'd give them like 10 bucks or whatever it is, and then you'd be able to do another one, right? So you could, and all these things have like, you know, pay as you go or monthly or yearly uh, plans, right? And so that, so that is um, uh, if you want it to go fast or it's too many photos for your thing. Make sense? Okay. So let's have it. And everybody can see this. So let's have a look as, as to what this stuff looks like. Um, okay. So here we go. So this is um, uh, the, the local manager, the local program that's on my computer. And a lot of this is running in the background. So a lot of this is not um, it's not designed for us to see the, the goings on. There's stuff going on. There, there's, there are activities going on in my processor, but I can't necessarily see them unless I call up some command line uh, and, and other, other tools, but you don't need to do. Anyway, but when you first start up, you click it, and um, you're going to get to something that looks like this. And you guys, can you guys see this? Should I make it bigger? Should I zoom in a little bit? Is that better? Okay. So uh, this is uh, the browser dashboard. And also I should say, excuse me, I should say the first time you guys go to start doing stuff, you're gonna have to log, you create, you know, create an account, you know, but that's the first step. But, but I've now created my account and this is what's going on. Um, my, pr my projects are in here, right? And so uh, what, I, what I do the first time is I click this select images and I, I upload individual images or I upload a whole folder, which usually you guys can be uploading a whole folder because you will have multiple images. Um, and so upload that folder. Okay, boom, then I get in there and then I basically say run. And this is gonna say essentially where my mapping project is. So this is gonna use, uh, I believe this uses open street maps, but uh, regardless, it's gonna sort of tell me kind of where I am, et cetera. Um, uh, and so I've run this map and, it, and it'll, it'll take a little bit of time. In my case, this one that we're going to look at here had 77 images, you know, a, a, a series of 77 images that were clicked on the drone and then when I downloaded it, that's what came out of the um, folder. It took on my computer which is a fairly new computer, but it's not, it's like, it's pre-COVID computer, so it's fairly new, but it's not, it's not, it's not ancient, but it's not, you know, this year's model. Um, and it took me uh, about 15 minutes to run that model, and it worked fine, right? And we'll look at it in a second. This one, I started to run, I started to run it the first time, and it didn't work. And so you can tell it didn't work because it get brrr, and it said not enough memory. And that was, that, was an, that was actually a user error on my end, what I, what I told it to do. But in this case, it started running for a few seconds and then it burnt through it and it said, oh, I, I didn't work. And when we do, in many of our projects, this happens to when we try to do this locally, just because we tend to do very large projects and they tend to be very complex. And, and it's, it's like playing a video game or doing... Um, video editing, these are, these are very processor intensive uh, tasks that we're asking the, our computers to do. Um, the kind of tasks that would not have been possible or not have been possible for us, maybe like a military research lab or something, but like say 15, 20 years ago would not have even been possible. There's, there's millions of calculations that are going into these uh, uh, things. This was the, the first one I ran with a, a smaller subset of the images. 
And what we can see here is that this was this is only about a little less than 50 images. It took this guy only 10 minutes to run. Now, these same 48 images, when you guys run them on your computer, maybe it's going to take you 10 minutes. Maybe it's going to take you 15, 20 minutes. Maybe it'll take yours, you know, six minutes. It, it, again, it, it's, it's going to be uh, machine dependent. Your, not just machine, but your particular configuration dependent. If you have a lot of other stuff that are run, that's running in the background, et cetera. Okay, and then if I click, and so, th so I, I've, I've, I did this, I selected stuff, I uploaded it, and I said go, and it was, it was doing its thing. And so here's, here's my product. It says, you know, when I, how I created it, what date, and then various things here, okay? So I'll, let's say, hey, I want to see what go, when, I can download the products to use in other analysis programs. But let's just say view 3D model. Okay, and so here's the thing that I made. Right, so I can spin this guy around. Um, I can I can zoom in. I'm supposed to be able to zoom in. Oops, how do I zoom in? Oh, because I have my screen zoomed in. That's what's going on. Um, so so right here, this is a three dimensional model, right? I can also just squish it down and make it flat. In some cases, all we want is a two dimensional model. So if we were mapping how the river channel was was cutting through the landscape, let's say. Yeah, I mean, it's three-dimensional, but do we really need it? The, the, the two-dimensional models will go much faster. Um, uh, and, and in many cases, that's mostly what we're interested in, right? Where, where, how far the fire burned or, or, or what have you. Um, but it's, it's, the same, it's the same deal, right? So when I zoom in, this, this right here is the generic... Uh, so, so I've just said make everything um, or ma make what I did invisible. And so this is the quality of the, of the free map from Google or OpenStreetMaps or whoever's providing it, right? And then as I turn this on, I'm going to bring our map into play. And you see it's, it's, uh, it's much crisper, right? It's higher resolution. We took with the drone. It's much closer. And like, for example, this was, who knows when they took this? When they took this, the sun looked to be mostly up and down. So I see some shadows here but it's fairly bright, right? Whereas when we took ours, it's reflecting more of the time of day, and this whole chunk is in deep shadow, for example. So maybe it was cloudy that day, so it was a little bit of sun, but it was, it was more diffuse or whatever. So um, if we wanted to do something where we want to look at um, phenology of a plant or whatever, right, we'd want to use our drone stuff. We want to take the photos at the distinct time of day or, or whatever, we, whatever we need. Okay. Um, now, the, okay, so then there's, there's some other things that we can do here. We're not worried about plant health because we, we're not, the stuff that we're using, and in this class probably the only stuff we'll use, is just regular, regular camera, right? So regular visual, the kind of same thing your eyeball sees. We have other sensors that um, are hyperspectral images that will go deeper into the infrared and, and various things that we can um, get a more detail as to plant functioning and stuff. That's not what we're doing here. So, so that doesn't really help us. But um, this will, another automatic routine, and again, the, the part that is colored is just the part that, that we did, right? So, that, so, so our model is overlain into real space over this, this area. Um, uh, what this is doing is now, just like you guys are used to seeing the color ramp for, uh, I don't know, populations or amount of rainfall, this is just the Z. So this color ramp here is referring to the height of the object. And so you can see Sierra Hall stands out very dramatically, and it's the tallest thing around, so it's the, the, the diff, most different from the purple color. Right? And so maybe that's helpful, maybe that's not helpful. Um, what do you want to do here? How do, I go, how do I go back? Okay, so let's go back to... Let's go back to here... Oh, no, 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 I don't want to do that. Sorry. I want to do this. Okay. So um, there's also a, a bunch of tools here. So now this is in real space, right? Sorry, with the, my screen sharing, it makes it a little hard for me to work the controls here. Okay. So, um, so here we are in real space. There's a bunch of tools we can use. Uh, there's also more sophisticated things we can do by bringing this in the GIS. Uh, and, and doing doing stuff, but for example, let's just um, let's just ask, hey, how you know how how big is this thing? So um, 
Oh, well, let's look at these tools first here. So this guy should show up. So this is angle measurements. If I want to see the degree of, of um, say, the, a wall or a path or something, this is going to tell me about a point. The most useful one, probably for quick and dirty for you guys, is going to be this distance measurement. There's also height measurement, so how far from the ground or from sea level. Um, this guy is to measure a diam uh, to me if, if you needed to figure out a circle, uh, angle, and then, you can, and then the polygon here is another one. So this would do, so whereas this bad boy is going to do the, the measurement between point A and point B, we can trace out an object and this will tell us what the, the you know, um, area is. And then there's other guys too. So for example, if I, if I click this dude and I, dr and I drag this guy, right? And we can change this to be in, in feet or miles or whatever the hell you want, right? So it's going to tell me this is uh, about the first segment I did was, you know, that's 70 meters, 20, right, right, all that kind of stuff. Okay. And then how do I, how do I, Jesus, now I have to kill this guy. How do I do that? Okay. So I can also do area. So I can measure how much, you know, this area is. And oops, and this is 100 and whatever, 125 square meters, right? So you guys get the idea. So this is not for maybe, you know, hardcore research stuff, but this would be for our just quick and dirty. Hey, approximately, what are we talking about here? Um, our X, oh, let me see if, okay, another thing I want to show you guys. Uh, let's do this. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm still learning how to navigate this thing since I'm not used to its output. But if we come over here and, um, I think I want to show you this. Okay. So again, this is the, the blurry stuff is the, the existing um, generic image. And this is us. And so let's just see what happens when we zoom in here. Okay. So this is what I want to show you. So let's make this. Okay. So th there's, there's the... Uh, here's the fountain right here, right, in the central mall. This is where it is. This is our background image. And as I raise this new map we created, it's not quite in the same spot, right? Close, but it's not quite the same spot. Similarly, similarly, he, let's see, where am I talking about? Um, so the path, the path is here, and the grass starts here, right? So this, this, there's, there's no grass here, right? So there's some alignment issues. So this is telling us that it's close, right? But it's not a perfect, it's not exactly perfectly well aligned. There's a couple things for that. There's a couple reasons for that. One, check it out. One, this is far, I'm, we focused the images over here. So there's very few images from this chunk. So there's very few images to map or, or, or the density. And sorry, again, remember what we're doing is we're taking all the photos putting them together and, and making a best guess. And then from that best guess, we're making a shape. We're making a topography in, in, in math space, right? With all these little points. And then, and then once that's all made, then we go back, grab our photos, re-stretch them over this new reality, right? And so different models, different assumptions, different condi conditions are gonna make that, that topology and that re-stretching better or less better. Right, and so in this case, um, the edge of our photos, there's only one or two photos that ca capture that, so it's a it's a less dense point cloud. Better will be in when we're on and around the building. Okay, there's also something else which we'll talk about in a bit, which are ground control points, which are going to help us, which are going to be a little bit, which are essentially like going in here and saying, ah. Here's the real corner of the fountain, right? You mathematical output structure from motion model think it's at this point, it's actually a meter over here, right? And so we'll, we'll sort of force it to make some of the points in space be in the real po in, in the, in the, at the reality location, right? And those ground control points or tie points will make it more accurate, right? So both those things will happen. The other thing is just that, that we can't fix. So some of this stuff we can fix. We can fix with more pictures. We can fix with uh, tie-ins or ground control points. Some things we can't fix. The things we can't fix are inherent in the models that we use to build this. So this open drill map uses 
a structure from motion model. That is different from PIX4D, which is different from drone deploy, right? Most of the companies now, if they use something, most of them that, that isn't their own, most of the people are licensing PIX4D. They, they won't tell you that, but the, when you, if you lift the hood, it would be PIX4D underneath the that stuff. But regardless, um, some models are better at, than, better at it than others. Some models are better at certain conditions than are others. And so that's just some, that's something we'll explore in a little, not today, but in a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll start looking at what, how well these different programs work by using our a same data set. So let's run them and see how, see how much mismatch there is between the real world and the, and the uh, predicted world, right? The other one, just for simplicity, the other one, I hope, is it, is anybody not taking GIS yet? Which is okay, I'm just curious, okay. Oh man, a lot of you guys. Okay, so, okay, let me step back then. Um, so, hmm, yeah, I probably should have put some slides in on this, but, um, but basically um, we are trying, so right now what we're doing, our little chunk of the planet right here is pretty, is pretty flat, right? So we've taken Sierra Hall, your seats, the lab bill, all this kind of stuff that's, that's three dimensional and shoved it into two dimensions on my computer screen or you guys that are looking up here in front of the classroom on the projector, right? And that's not, that's hard to do. It sounds kind of simple, that's really hard. It's really, really hard, right? In fact, I'll, when we break, I'll play you a, a funny video about that in a second. But, um, but basically, um, there's assumptions that are made. What we use is a mathematical representation of the, of the Earth. And then we use that to project things, right? To sort of transform our two-dimensional stuff into three-dimensional reality. We all assume that the Earth is round. It's not round. It's more like a slightly smushed orange or tangerine. And so, again, this doesn't matter for most things that we're doing, but for this kind of stuff, for this kind of stuff right here where we're trying to perfectly match it up, it does matter. And so this is why in some places, uh, and, 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 and so... Uh, the thing that you're most, almost everybody here uses is Google, right? Google Earth. So they use a different geoid. They use a different underlying mathematical assumption for the shape of the Earth than we use in most of our GIS applications. They use a simplified version of the shape of the Earth because it's much faster, right? So for, for all these gazillion images all the time, it's just, it's just a more efficient processing thing, but it's not quite right. And so what you find is you can find some areas on Google Earth, some places up in Santa Barbara and some other places where the, the picture or the, the, the map says you're on the middle of street X and you might be like 20 feet away from that thing, right? Again, most things we're doing, navigating to the pizza parlor or whatever, doesn't so much matter. But when we're doing this kind of stuff, now that you guys are beginning to enter this drone world where we're doing high resolution, fine scale mapping, these little issues matter. So nothing here is, is debilitating whatever, but you just need to be aware of them, right? And if I was just making this, if, if the question was for my construction company, hey, is, you know, how much have we built on, um, on Sierra Hall right now or whatever, right? We don't care about that. We don't care if it's five feet off or whatever, right? In a lot of cases, we don't care. But in some cases, when we're doing, trying to map this to historic imagery, when we're trying to see how much of the slide has happened since we last mapped, for those kind of more precise things, we do need to know. And then again, just because some of you guys have not taken GIS, I'll just say that we're pretty darn good in the X and Y. So we're pretty accurate in the X and Y with just generic freeware stuff, kind of generic stuff. Where we have much more problem is with the Z, is with the elevation. So the air, the amount of air there is a lot, is a lot more messed up, is, is, and that's where um, we get into many more problems compared to the, the Latin lawn or the X and Y thing. Cool. Okay. Um, so uh, yes. So that's what else I want to say about this by way of introduction. Um, so uh, this one. Okay, guys. Okay, there's other things we can get from this, uh, this stuff. Um, let me clear this. Is um, 
can't see that. Why can't you see that? Okay, maybe you can see it like this. Um, okay, so these are all the locations of where, of the, in space where the drone was when it snapped the picture, right? Pictures. This is, um, this is adding additional texture onto this. We can mess with um, how we want it to look visually. Um, and we can add all these, these other filters if we want to start to do stuff like, like shade out certain things and things of that nature. So, um, so there's all kinds of fun playing around that we can do. But have a look right here. I don't know why I can't zoom in. There we go. Okay, there we go. So here we go. So when we look straight down on this bad boy. He looks like a, a uh, it looks like a building, right? So this, this, this lining is because I'm, I'm zoomed in for the screen. So the, this line doesn't show up on the, on the real model, but because I'm so zoomed in, it's, it's an artifact of the projector. But, but, okay, you guys see it, right? So it's a building. Okay, cool. But then when I turn like this, oh my God, it's the end of the world, right? There's no walls. There's no sides to this, right? That's because the, the way we flew this, we had the camera pure nadir. We had it straight down. So a little bit of this, right? So a little bit here, like these windows, when, all right, so when, when I don't know which one, this camera, the, the drone was in this position, you know, the imagery caught some of those sides of the windows, right? So there's a little bit that we get, but the vast majority, sorry, but the vast majority of this stuff looks like the end of the world. So if we did, if we were interested in mapping a building, we would want to, you know, first do that nadir pass, look down and make sure we got all the locations. One, because that's mostly what we, mostly what we care about, but it's also going to tell us where we are in, in two dimensional space, right? So we want to do this first, but then afterwards, what we would do is we'd go back and fly another run. Uh, and, and in things like Pix4D, they give you control. You, there, there are default settings for this for doing a building, for example, because this is done so frequently. But basically, uh, we're going to fly and we're going to have the camera typically at like a 45 degree angle. And it's going to go around and it's going to encircle the target uh, several times or depending on how many times you want, right? Again, same thing, same thing applies. Overlap has to happen, right? And, and it'll do that. And then we'll be able to, when we run the next model, we can actually get sides in the full three-dimensionality of our, of our object, right? Sound cool? All right. So with that, I want you guys to try doing a little uh, run with, with, our, with our samples. Now let me show you what we're talking about here. So I've shared this folder with you. So I've shared this folder with you guys. And so that, that um, and we just did a test. If you guys came in late, we just did a little quick test, make sure you guys could download these things. So that's cool. Um, so let me first say, uh, these, as, as soon as we start doing large things, it'll start eating up a lot of space, right? A lot, so just, let's just be forewarned. So I tr I'm trying to focus on some things that are relatively small so that we can get the ideas without crashing everybody's uh, computers or, or without, without forcing you to go online for cloud processing. Cool? All right. So um, I have some examples here, but we're just going to talk about Sierra Hall today. So if you click on Sierra Hall, um, you find there's circle, GCPs, uh, grid, right? And so, so, the, so this is uh, different sets, right? And if you were to click on any one of these photos, you would see this is just a nice high resolution photo from our drone, right? Um, at a particular angle, at a particular point, et cetera. Okay. Okay, so the first thing I'd like you guys to do, and I'd like you guys to do this either, so we'll break for a second. If you guys haven't installed Open Drone Map, I want you to make sure you have installed that. If you haven't, if you haven't started your account, I want you to start and activate your account, right? And uh, we just need to do this once per group. So if you don't have your computer, just as long as somebody in the group has a computer, we, we can do that. And what I want you to do is I want you to go into Sierra Hall and let's just start with grid. So just go to, just, just upload the photos from the grid folder do a run and let's see how long, uh, so let's see if it works hopefully on your computer and then two, let's see how long it takes you to do it. And then you guys can open it up on your computer and you can start seeing how the process 
works. Does that make sense? General questions for that? The whole approach generally making sense of what we're doing? All right, ready, steady, go.